right? And you know what? We have another guy who knows his stuff coming on right now, Peter Bookvar. So Peter's here today, Steve, if you're Oh, through. we have Peter. That is actually great. Uh, it's yeah. nice to get Peter's yeah, uh, input what of... See what of Peter, uh, who I know is, uh, you know, looking for inflation or reflation because of supply chain issues and looking for a weaker dollar, we have we've had, a, we've had the interesting conversations on the summit about inflation right. rate and how inflation in essence is different for people, you know, that have, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of wealth and people that are actually, you know, striving to make ends meet. And, you know, it makes sense. Yeah. Hi, and, uh, hey, Peter. Hey, how are hey, you? P Welcome Good. back. How have you been? Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be showing the charts, Peter. Uh, how are you? And uh, Good, thanks. Do you, mind if we, uh, do you mind if we start with the yields, buddy? Yeah, let's go ahead. All right, so, um, you know, here's a move in yields that we had here. And I know, um, you know, Paul has been saying, um, not thinking about thinking about thinking about. So why are rates grinding up and starting to become sticky and uh, you look at some uh, longer term charts it almost looks like they're threatening to come out of a base here and you know that we could head up towards 120 uh, if this uh, technical pattern is valid what's behind it well I, I think it's it's the, the market sort of reasserting um, some opinions on the state of things from from the Fed uh, okay. I, I think what's even more noteworthy than the rise in the 10 years, the rise in the 30 year yield. And, and I bring up the 30 go. year because the 30 year is the, the least influenced by Fed policy because it's the furthest out on the curve. So I think we've seen a rise in inflation expectations. Uh, 10 year break evens are at the highest levels. Uh, we're near the, near the highest levels um, in a while. Uh, you have commodity prices that uh, you know, outside of crude oil have, that have been trending higher. Uh, the CRB food index is at the highest level since some, um, or near the highest level since tw mid-2019. You've had uh, industrial uh, metals that have been trending higher. Obviously, yes. you have good performance in gold and silver. You have the hopes on all this fiscal spending, which, re re right. you know, regardless of, of, of how productive you think it'll be spent, uh, it's still another trillion dollars plus on top of three trillion that's been already spent. Uh, there's enormous amount of, of issuance. And um, I, I, I think so that, the bond uh, vigilantes have been uh, reincarnated in this era. Do you think? You know, I think that they're slowly, slowly beginning to perk their heads up. And also you, yeah. you've had some decent news with some of the antivirals. I mean, yeah. if you believe that that COVID is not forever with us, uh, I think that over the next couple of months, we may continue to get some good news on that front. We could get, you know, we're going to get the phase three trials from Pfizer at the end of October, early November. And while I think that there will be some, some side effects that they'll talk about, um, I think overall, it could be some good news. And I think, you know, the day you get good news on a vaccine, uh, I find it hard to believe that the 10 year yield is still going to be this low. So I think you combine that all. And uh, I expect higher inflation, I expect higher longer term rates. And uh, I don't think the market is is even in the ballpark in thinking that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, there could be some uh, reassessment, uh, especially if they double from here and say we go to 130 on the 10 year. Um, I, and I want to get to that, what effects you think it's going to have on the markets. But I also wanted to ask you this. So, you know, here, I mean, TLT is a proxy for sovereigns, right? And you see we're threatening and, you know, the bond market uh, threatening a breakdown or already has. My question is, why are sovereigns weaker than high yield? And why are they weaker than uh, corporates? Well, I, I think corporates are still getting a bid because they think that a big fiscal government spending plan is going to, you know, save these corporations and another you know, 25 billion plus to the airline industry is going to, you know, save the airline 
uh, bondholders. So I, I think that is, at least for now, one of the reasons why corporate credit has traded the way it has relative to um, treasury yields. Because I know you and I were trained that uh, the flight to qualities in uh, treasuries, not corporates, not uh, high yielders, and that we have a weaker structure. Uh, has the Fed, um, in a way, sacrificed sovereign debt to support these other two markets? No, I, th I think they're, they're trying to save everything. I mean, essentially, Fed policy right now is just monetizing the, 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 the U.S. Treasury. And okay. there, there's nothing stimulative in, in, in what the Fed is doing. Uh, having rates at zero hurts small and medium-sized regional banks because it squeezes their profit margins on loans. If you squeeze the earnings capability and the loan margins for small and medium-sized banks, that means they lend less money to small and medium-sized businesses that don't have access to the capital markets. So I argue that Fed policy is restricting growth. It is not contributing to it. And therefore, the only purpose of what Fed policy is, is to monetize the treasury market, uh, lift asset prices, including corporate bonds, and, 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 and hope that stock prices go up. That's all that monetary policy is doing right now. Okay. Peter, right. a pessimistic counter argument having to do with that is that the same banks you're talking about, and first of all, I agree 100% with uh, what you said, but the counter argument is that the balance sheet of the banks is such and, and has, um, um, is heavy on stuff that if yields actually move higher, uh, it's going to implode because in essence, a lot of what they hold in their balance sheet is not going to survive higher yields. Well, yes, I agree. But based on that argument, that means if you're talking about Europe, that means rates will stay negative forever. I mean, at uh, some point, at some point, rates, yeah. rate, rates have to go back to at least zero in Europe. And exactly. That's why I agree with you. So, I think they, they've painted the sel themselves in a corner and there is no good way out of it. Well, th th that, that's clear. I mean, the, the, the ECB, if we want to shift to, to, to them, they're not just going to be able to just raise rates back to zero. It's going to have to be part of, of, of an agreement with the entire Eurozone that if they need to recapitalize banks, uh, then they're going to have to do that at the same time, or they'll have to waive mark to market rules on their massive holdings of, of European sovereign paper. So there will be hand in glove uh, discussions going on when the time comes when the ECB wants to get out of negative interest rates. Agreed. Okay, so Peter, if we're gonna have a rise in yields, um, is that eventually going to uh, compress and make valuations uh, look even more expensive than they are? At and some point, yes. I mean, I, I'm sure the initial reaction, we've seen it this week with the rally in the stock market, that the initial reaction on- It's good, of, it's good news. Week, well, the, yeah, it's good news. Rates are rising for the right reason, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I've heard that movie many times in many cycles over the last 30 plus years. And then you reach a point where that rise in rates starts to matter in terms of uh, it, it's impact like 87. On, we on had just intermediation. It, yeah. Exactly. And people have to look at the rate of change in rates, not the absolute level in rates, because I'm sure there'll be people out there and say, and even if the tenure went to one and a half, oh, it's still very low. It's no big deal even though a one and a half rate, if we were to get there, would be more than a doubling or actually a tripling from yeah. the lows. So I yeah. think people need to focus more on rate of change, especially when you're paying high multiples for stocks and especially when you're trading at 20, 21 times, 2021 earnings, and we're not even done with 2020. Okay, so uh, that uh, stocks, uh, how about, you know, they talk about one of the, uh, and, you know, I, I'm still bullish long term, but I'm looking at the gold chart and uh, silver has even been weaker than gold on the gold silver ratio the last few months. Um, if yields head up, doesn't that um, create more opportunity costs for the precious metals for a while and they could be under pressure? 
only if the inflation numbers don't rise as well, uh, as okay. I'm of the belief that we are going to see further increases in the inflation statistics. Uh, I, I think uh, the inflation numbers will rise coincident with or even more than the rise in, in market rates. Uh, okay. So that's okay. why I think real rates still have room to fall. And uh, it'll be real rates that the gold and silver market focuses on more so than the nominal real rate, uh, nominal rate market. Okay. And the dollar, Peter, I mean, it's trying to make a stand here. Uh, here's your daily, you know, we've had a little reflex rally. Um, I bet uh, being a mine reader, you'd be a willing seller of the dollar on any further strength up between here and here on Dixie. Am I correct that, um, is there, a, is there a place where dollar bears are going to have to say um, it's not going to happen for a while? I mean, the is dollar, rally, level? The dollar yeah. rally really happened only on days when the market didn't think to be a stimulus package. So we're at a point oh. where the dollar is rallying because there's bad news, not because there's this positive backdrop to the fundamental story with the dollar. I mean, we had a near record trade deficit this week. Yeah. We have current account deficits that continue to widen. We have budget deficits that are exploding. There's no, there's no long-term bull case for the dollar that makes any sense to me. Even uh, yields the, the going bull up? bull case for the dollar is really just on short-term um, factors and like if, if things hit the fan or there's this dollar shortage that I've been hearing about forever. Yeah, that, um, you don't, but you don't buy into that, that all these emerging market economies that have their debt based uh, um, in dollars. Um, that creates a shortage in dollars to service their debt and roll it over, et cetera. Well, the, one offset, that, the one offset to that is that a lot of these countries that have companies that have these dollar denominated debts and even the countries that have dollar denominated debts, they also have a, a higher percentage of dollar reserves than they've, they've had before. So we need to look at both sides of the balance sheet when, when analyzing uh, these dollar liabilities. We have to look at the dollar assets as well and I think it's more balanced than, than people make it out to seem. Okay, and any plus, reason plus, why? Go, you know, go plus ahead. Plus, that foreigners still own about a third of the U.S. Treasury market. So if they needed to sell U.S. Treasuries to get dollars, uh, that's something that they can do. And it's certainly something they did uh, pretty aggressively uh, last March. Okay, uh, you know, this recent pop in rates has uh, supported banks uh, the XLF, and I think, what is it, KRE for the regionals, Peter? Yeah. Um, so that's going to be, uh, if we're right about higher yields, that's going to be so supportive for that group. I just wanted to, you know, ask you why you think, and this rotation that's going on, it seems like they're selling, you know, the high flyers. Um, I've asked a few people that. Uh, it Could it be um, that they're prepping for, higher capital gain taxes on a Biden victory and they have such outsides gains and, and things like Amazon and Apple and uh, Google and, you know, all of them that they're, they're booking those and rotating into things that really haven't participated like the transports are on the verge uh, after two years of finally making a new high. Uh, what's your comment on the rotation? Uh, do you think it's, something that's going to stick for a while because when I look at some of these issues here, Peter, um, I don't think Amazon's going to make a new high before we see it take uh, some more air taken out. And you look at something like Google, look at this on the daily, the only thing it's holding and it's been a pretty weak bounce. And I think, you know, we could even bounce a little bit more, but it's threatening a pretty important breakdown that could take it down to, you know, 1,200, 1,100. Uh, what do you think is behind this? Uh, could it be people would rather take capital gains now at the current rate and not wait until uh, the presidential election to do so? Could I mean, I, I think, it? yeah, I mean, I think that that's definitely a factor, but I, I think, that that decision won't be made in earnest until after we see the results of that election. Um, because of Trump's Isn't that one of the silliest uh, reasons to make a decision in the markets? Um, well, tax consequences? Yeah, but, but, but keep in mind though, that if, if Trump wins, that person will be saying, well, why did I sell? I could have just held on and not have to pay that tax, even though yeah. it would have been a lower. So 
I, I, to well, me, the, the election is a lot more of a coin toss than the polls make it out to seem. So okay. um, while, yeah, maybe some people want to start trimming going into the election because they don't want to be forced to sell the day after if everyone else is doing the same. But on the other hand, Trump wins, then, you know, there could be some regret. I think at least right now, because we still have a month to the election or almost a month in, in, in politics, that seems like an eternity. A lifetime. That, yeah. you know, I think that the steepening yield curve is, is, is resulting in uh, obviously a shift into, into the banks that could actually get a breather from right. that. Uh, if it were to continue, uh, I think the rise in rates to the point about maybe uh, shifting the, 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 the mania for growth, high value growth stocks into forcing people to start looking at cheaper materials, things that they paid attention to in years, exactly materials coincident with what I said yeah. earlier about uh, right. the, the, the bounce in the, in the, in the CRB index. Uh, you know, it, 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 those are the type of things that, I think maybe the market's looking at and and you look at the fiscal spending again. I mean, Washington is going to spend, they've already spent 3 trillion. They want to spend another one to 2 trillion. Um, that, that, you know, th this is inflationary Tinder and um, uh, you're already beginning to see it in the, in the, in the stats. We're, we're going to see CPI next week. Um, I think the rent component will be the only thing that, of note that is muted because of obviously we see what's going on with rents but I think goods prices are, are accelerating here. And um, I think we're looking at a stagflationary type of environment next year. And uh, I think we're maybe beginning to see uh, the early market responses to that. What do you think the market response is gonna be, Peter, if we don't have an outcome? And it's contested and it drags on for weeks and weeks. How do you, do you think the markets can just uh, treat everything as business as usual in that circumstance? I, I think the market will be highly aggravated by that scenario, but I still think there's the belief that once you get past the next two to three weeks or even a month, that you'll still have a winner. And that come January 20th, you will have a winner regardless of who it is. So it's going to be extremely ag aggravating. It'll be embarrassing. Uh, but a lot of it will have to do with who takes the Senate. I think if the Republicans keep the Senate, then I think there'll be less aggravation uh, as to the ultimate result. I never realized until this administration how powerful the Senate was compared to other branches of government. They've kind of run the show. Hasn't, doesn't McConnell kind of remind you of a Jim Baker type or a Dick Cheney type where um, it's really not the president running the show, it's uh, uh, someone else? Well, I think that, um, um, I mean, I think, I think that is a good point, but I, I think the markets at least, they just want to see a split Congress yeah. Whether it's Republicans having the Senate or, or having the House, uh, they at least want to see a split if, if, if Biden wins. And you know, Biden, who said he wants to raise taxes by $4 trillion, uh, I, I, I think yeah. that there needs to be uh, a party in, in, in Washington that is opposite him so he doesn't right. raise taxes by $4 trillion. Okay. Um, any view on uh, what's happening in China? You know, I actually have read articles that they're, they have this new thing, clean plate um, philosophy. They're not giving people as much food to eat daily. It's kind of like a soft famine where they're um, just not giving people the same amount of food to eat. Uh, what do you think is happening there in China? I know that you, you know, you think Asia and um, a lot of emerging economies are the place to be. Any updates on any of those areas that uh, have, you know, garnered your attention? Well, the, the most interesting thing about China is that the economy is, is pretty much back open. Movie theaters yeah. are 90% back to where they were. Domestic wow. air travel, I think, is, is basically at where it was pre the Wuhan shutdown. So the Chinese economy, in terms of its reopening, is essentially back. Now, the economy is not back because there's a lot of damage that has been done. But you know, they, they feel like you know, the virus is essentially gone. It's in the past. And I think we're seeing 
the entire region that has dealt with this so much better than Europe and the U.S. And they're now seeing the benefits of that and that their economies uh, didn't suffer the same sort of downturn and are going to see a quicker rebound. So uh, I, I think I'm hoping that we can use China as a model that, that when people are comfortable here with, with vaccines and antivirals, that we can go back to having 100% capacity in, in movie theaters and football games and restaurants uh, pretty much as they do right now. What's your best guess, Peter? Back half of 21 or before that when we could be uh, close to the way Chinese are living right now? I mean, I'm hoping late spring. I mean, hoping by July 1st, there are going to be concerts again. I think by, okay. at, by then, um, we'll, you know, we'll, not only will we have effective antivirals and hopefully vaccines, but we'll have rapid testing that, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get tested and, and you'll get a response within 15 minutes. I mean, that, that, that in itself can change things. Yeah, you got to show up to the sporting event 15 minutes early where you got to show up to the restaurant 15 minutes early where, where, where the airport 15 minutes early. But if you can do that, get tested in, in something that's highly accurate because it still needs to improve its accuracy and then, and then get into, uh, get on, get on a plane and get in, move into a restaurant and, and, or movie theater and knowing that everyone you're sitting next to has tested negative. I think that's that that's going to be really helpful. So I'm hoping I, I, that yeah. late spring and and early summer is when we uh, we get to that. So it, it's still going to be a, a a rough sled from from here to there. We got to get through the winter, and that's not going to be easy. No, it uh, is not. It, is it? This is a, a generational traumatic experience that uh, it's going to take years to recover from. But um, at least for the beaten down areas of the economy. Uh, like the local restaurant and then like a yeah. movie theater or, or, or stadium, um, I do think that uh, ho hopefully within the next uh, six months that that, 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 gets, that gets better. Now, unfortunately, we're going to lose a lot of businesses in between, and that's where the pain comes. But uh, hopefully we're closer to the end of this uh, than anything. Well, you know, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to my concert at the Coyote Bar and Grill next spring. I know I'm not Eddie Van Halen, but I do a decent Elvis, Peter. That, that would be great if we were able to pack that place. <laughs> so, you know, I, I want to thank you again for, you know, being a regular in our community. And you did a great job in the Trader Summit. And I appreciate uh, you and your work and encourage people to hit the subscribe button here for the book report by Peter Bookvar and uh, you know, when you're feeling like you don't know what's going on, um, Peter will give you a dose of sanity and really um, hope that you have a, a great fall season and we'll get back together maybe in December and see how things are progressing through this uh, kind of difficult winter that we're all facing, Peter. Thank you very much. for. Being yeah, thank you, guys. I always appreciate being on. All right, buddy. All right, Peter Bookvar, and you can find him at P. Bookvar on Twitter. And book report, B O O C K report.com. And that'll be a wrap, everyone. Have a great rest of the day, and we'll see you tomorrow, TGIF. Thanks again, buddy.